so my name is Sarah Brumfield. I'm uh, here today assisted by my partner in life and business, Ben Brumfield. And uh, we're talking today about understanding chat GPT for libraries and archives. Um, we're going to talk about what chat GPT is and how it works, um, different modes for interacting with chat GPT, lying, attribution, and copyright, because I know those are very common questions, and then what it means for libraries, archives, librarians, and archivists. Um, I'm sprinkling some exercises through my talk. Um, at the end, we'll give you a link to uh, a resources document that has some other articles you might want to read and also has the exercises in it. So it's this isn't a workshop, it's, it's just a webinar, but uh, you might want to choose to go do those exercises after we're done. Um, it's pretty intense material and it's going to take up most of our hour. Uh, we I will take questions at the end, but you might have to stick around a little bit past the top of the hour to get all those questions answered. So I'm trying to get through it all, but so why me? Uh, I'm a techno optimist, but I'm also a realist. I have a bachelor's degree in computer science, but I also have a degree in humanities and the study of women and gender. And I love reading and writing and thinking about technology. That's my sweet spot. Um, I've been a digital humanities consultant for about seven years, and Ben and I do a lot of projects around digital editions, triple IF, and we run from the page. So from the page is our crowdsourcing platform. Um, we have about a hundred institutions that run projects on it for transcription, metadata description, indexing, photo identification. Um, because it's a crowdsourcing platform, we think hard about the human and the technology. We write technology, we're software engineers, but we're also building a platform that humans, that people, often retirees who are very passionate about history and genealogy and local history, are partnering with institutions to turn digital images into searchable, accessible text. So I try to bring that empathy that we apply to our software engineering to thinking about how chat GPT and AI more broadly will affect all of us. So I love this cartoon on the right. I'm not an expert in AI. I took one class in college many years ago, um, but I do have a good technical grounding. And since this has kind of hit the zeitgeist, I've been doing a lot of reading and digging in and experimentation and a lot of thinking. So you don't have to assume that everything I say is 100% correct. I'd encourage you to do your own research and learn on your own. But part of the challenge in this field is that it's changing so quickly that it can your, what you know can get out of date very quickly. Um, I'll tell you when what I'm bringing to you is likely to change um, and change quickly. So um, it's a big deal, really. Uh, I was thinking about how to explain how big of a deal it was to you. And I was thinking about comparing it to the web browser and the World Wide Web. And then uh, I ran, I read this article by Bill Gates and he's like, this this is big and it's big like the microprocessor was big, the personal computer was big, the internet was big, the mobile phone was big. It's going to change everything. Um, there's a lot of whiz bangery out there showing how amazingly smart ChatGPT is. It is and it isn't. There's a lot of negative press talking about how sentient it is or how it will seek power. It isn't and I don't think it will. Um, it'll, hear about how it will put many of us who write words or programs out of jobs. I don't think it will, but it will make our jobs very different and more efficient, and it probably will configure what those jobs look like and perhaps how many there are. So a classic marketing technique for technology is to use fear, uncertainty, and doubt to sell your ideas or your products. Um, what I'm hoping is that this presentation will give you a good basis for wading through the, all that information for gut checking what you read. Uh, the thing to realize is things are moving fast. Things changed while I was writing this even. And this presentation is going to generate more questions than it answers. And it's okay if you disagree with me on some of this, because what we need is a good civil discourse around the implications of this new technology. But I think you should ask yourself whether there is a scenario of the future that doesn't involve AI and AI in everyday life. I don't think there is. So we all have a responsibility to learn and to think about how it works and what it means. So what is ChatGPT? Um, 
ChatGPT is what we call a large language model. That's kind of the technical classification of, of what it is, which means a whole bunch of statistics around language um, that is generative AI. Generative means it generates, in this case, text because it's a language model. It's trained on billions of words. And the, the easiest metaphor for understanding it is autocomplete on steroids. So let's look at an example interaction. So the basic model is you ask a question using human language. We call these questions prompts and ChatGPT returns with text. That's the core of the interaction. But there's two pieces here, right? There's the chat, which is the interface where you put in a prompt and you get an answer. It's a dialogue, you can go back and forth and ChatGPT will remember a certain amount of the conversation that came before. Can you tell me more? Or how are digital librarians different? It's a lot more efficient than doing a search and clicking on a series of web pages to answer a question. Uh, the second half of chat GPT is GPT. That's the current model behind the chat chat GPT. Um, the current one is called uh, GPT 3.5. Uh, GPT 4 is available to folks who are willing to pay OpenAI a little bit of money, but I suspect that they'll move it to free sometime in the next couple of months. Um, these are the large language models that are behind this technology. So my, my first exercise for you is to go sign up for chat GPT. You can log in with a Google account and type something in. So that will put you in the minority of folks who've actually tried it, and that's a good first step. I think of ChatGPT as a cocky teenager. It thinks it knows everything, but in reality, it only knows what it has already encountered in the world. In other words, what it's been trained on. It can reason based on what it knows, but it can't generate knowledge. So my second exercise for you is to play 20 questions with ChatGPT. So this is where you, you hold the something in your head and your, your partner or your partners ask you questions trying to determine what the item is. Um, I did this and the item I happened to have in my head was a bottle of champagne as the thing to guess. And while ChatGPT understood the structure of the game really well, it didn't have the context of knowing I like sparkling wine or knowing, being able to ask about my house and knowing its contents or knowing that my interests might make me likely to think of that. Uh, my children would be much, much better at playing this game with me than ChatGPT was. Um, where things are going to get interesting is when we start combining knowledge bases and large language models. Um, it's not so much that it, that GPT, these GPT models need more knowledge, but what they need is something, a person, a computer, to tell it, this is the knowledge you need to pay attention to for this problem you're trying to solve right now. Um, and I think there's a lot of potential that we'll see in the coming years around that. So what has ChatGPT been trained on? Um, where did that knowledge come from? So GPT 3.5 was uh, trained on 300 billion words, it's a lot, um, 570 gigabytes of data. What those words and that data was is kind of the open web up to about 2021. So that includes Wikipedia, it includes Reddit, um, and we all know that they're already, just by choosing that as your corpus of knowledge, that you're going to, to skew your results. So 78% of people in North America use the internet, only 20% of people in Sub-Saharan Africa do. So poof, skew right there, a big one. Um, we know that Wikipedia, 15% of Wikipedians, less than 15% of Wikipedians are women. Um, so then you've got a gender skew there. Uh, Reddit contributors, 70% of them are white and 64% are under 30. If we sometimes wonder why ChatGPT sounds like a cocky teenager, that may be a little bit of it. It's also kind of how the model was built, and it's something that uh, OpenAI actually is working on. It's uh, working on giving you ways to kind of change the tone that uh, ChatGPT and, and the GPT models respond with. So even with these limitations, though, it's really, really good. It works. Um, it's good at facts, especially, and there are lots of facts on the, 
the internet, the open web. So this is from a research paper published by OpenAI, the developers of ChatGPT, and um, they took a number of standardized tests, generally from the US, and uh, ran the model through answering the tests, and then they graded them either, it was either test releases or they sent it to be, to be graded. And the model did really, really well. Um, I think the sixth one here is really interesting. This is the uniform bar exam. So uh, what many states use to decide whether you're qualified to practice law in their state. And um, it scored in the 90th percentile. So law, arguably, the, the baseline of, of being a good lawyer is knowing the facts, right? And being able to use them. Um, I have a high schooler who's been taking AP classes. These are college credit classes that you can take in high school and her environmental science class, she took the test in about two weeks ago. So on the far right, the model scored in the 90th percentile for that. Um, one of the first things she did when we started playing with this was take one of the essay questions from last year's AP English test. Uh, it was about the significance of the green light and the great Gatsby and ChatGPT put out a very competent essay. Um, one of the other interesting things about how, about this, this graph is the blue is GPT 3.5, what's currently available, uh, in chat GPT just generally. Um, the green lines are GPT 4 and things are getting better. Like you can't get better on what's already good, but like it improved on many, many of these tests. And this was in about a four month period. So this technology is iterating and improving very quickly. Um, there's lots of other large language models out there. Um, I'm watching this one, Dolly, because it has uh, open instructions. You can kind of dig in and look and see how it weighs the statistics that go into what the answers are. But uh, one of the other big names is Hugging Face. Um, it's named after an, an emoticon. Um, Google Bard, Facebook has one, Apple, every major tech player is working on their own offerings here and figuring out how to build it into their products. Um, it's not just text. Um, what we're talking about is large language models. So those large language models are can work with anything that depends heavily on or can be described by text. So uh, voice to text transcription is one of the I think one of the places where we're starting to see this a lot, I have a lot of a number of friends who use Otter AI to transcribe meetings like this one that they're in. Um, Whisper AI, I'm very excited about. This is another open AI offering and it's, it's voice to text, but our friends at the University of North Texas used it to uh, transcribe hundreds of hours of, of archival recordings, um, specifically a lot of sermons. And so when you think about, okay, archival recordings, not the best quality to start with, uh, sermons, this is not someone speaking into a microphone in a soundstage, this is someone taking a recording um, that's in a church and is not, it's not necessarily the highest quality recording. And they were able to get really good results out of that process. In fact, Will, who ran that, is, is going to come and do a, a webinar for us in a month or two, um, repeating the presentation he actually just gave two days ago at the Texas Conference on Digital Libraries. Um, there's uh, also image to text transcription. So when you snap a picture with your iPhone and it you know gives you kind of a yellow square around some of the text and offers to let you copy that text, um, that is what kind of we traditionally think of that as OCR, but that's not what is happening under the covers. Um, it's actually a large language model combined with image processing that that gets you that text to copy. Um, our friends at Transcribus build models based on transcriptions of a particular hand or an era, perhaps, era and location. Um, some of those transcriptions come from, from the page and we're working on actually ways of tying our system and theirs together. So you can use kind of crowdsource transcriptions to train a model in Transcribus and then apply it to the rest of a corpus. Um, and then there, you know, the model that you create there can be used to automatically transcribe material, other material in the same, in the same hand. Um, I think one of the more interesting ones is music. Um, OpenAI's Jukebox is their kind of music generation um, project. And I think it's easier to understand the limitations of this type of technology by listening. Um, this is this is actually terrible. So I'm from Texas. I happen to like country music. Um, it's 
Korean music is not the most sophisticated music, but when I tried to listen to this very first example, um, I had to turn it off. It was so bad. Uh, there's a lot of structure in music, and it refers backwards in time to repeat choruses and motifs. And the models are not so good at looking backwards. They're very good at predicting the future, but they're not as good at looking backwards. Now, that being said, I have in the last week read about two different things. Google has a music generation thing they're doing, and I found a website that would let people share generated music. So maybe it's better than I think, but from my very limited experimentations, this, this has a long way to go. Um, but my next exercise for you is to go listen to your favorite genre of music as generated by OpenAI and see what you think. So how do these large language models work and why should you care? So it's important to understand, at least at a high level, how they work. Um, when you understand they're less scary, they're less inscrutable. I mentioned earlier they're autocomplete on steroids. So let's dig into that just a little bit. Uh, this is a text visualization called a word tree. Um, we love these because there are great things to do with text transcribed in from the page. Um, but word trees are a way of visualizing the statistical commonness of the next word in a series. So ChatGPT is based on statistics. It guesses the next word in a sequence. Um, so if you imagine a model based on the Bible, the prompt in the could lead to in the beginning or in the rain or in the time. But statistically, in the beginning just shows up twice. So it is less likely to be in an answer generated from a model that's been trained on the Bible. But of course, it's more complicated. Um, after guessing once, just the next word, it takes, the model takes all of the prompt plus all of the response so far and asks for the next word. So in our Bible example, um, would not, or actually this one is trained just on Genesis. Um, it would not make sense to say in the morning of Egypt, because those, those words don't come after each other, right? But instead, by giving it the whole context, we can say, follow the tree of what we've been given so far. So you can say, in the morning, and I can't even read that because it's so small on my, my slide. Um, so we see that the most common sequence of words in this particular example is in the land of Cana. But that doesn't guarantee that that's the answer ChatGPT would give us. It's like rolling a weighted die. The die is weighted to make land more likely to come up, but there's always a chance of different next words showing up, like field or morning. Um, and that's kind of where you get some of the creativity that comes in. You get different answers depending on how you ask your question or even just each time you ask your question. But of course, it's more complicated. So it's not actually word for word. Um, these models pull important terms out of the input, and it weighs the next words that are close to those terms heavier. They're more statistically important. Um, so imagine that our corpus of words was uh, not just the book of Genesis or even the Bible, but the whole internet. And if I asked it, write the beginning of a story based on the book of Genesis from the King James Bible, I'd expect Genesis and King James Bible to be important. But it also decided that beginning and story were important. And we ended up with an almost word for word story of creation from the beginning of the book of Genesis in the King James Bible. So even when I was trying to kind of come up with an example of this, I wasn't thinking all of those words were the important ones, but it identified them as important. Um, this lets you start doing some really interesting things by combining important terms, like this retelling of Cinderella based on the book of Genesis. So this is where it starts looking like magic, right? Um, we can't visualize how it got these results using our simplistic word tree metaphor, but it's using the same underlying mechanism. Just start visualizing your tree in 10, 10 billion dimensions with statistical weighing of nearby and important words, and it's more than you can hold in your head, but computers can. Um, but of course, it's more complicated. So there's steps after building these, tr these 
trees. We're going to call them trees, even though they're they're not. Um, they're called vector spaces, but that's irrelevant. Um, that start nudging the tree, start nudging the statistics. Um, so, for instance, for a given already existing human written text, how good is the model at predicting the next word? And if it predicts the next word correctly, we're going to nudge that higher. If it predicts the next word incorrectly, we're going to nudge that lower. So this example here are uh, the limitations that are at the bottom of uh, the OpenAI paper on ChatGPT. And one of the things they do to train the, the model is they have humans evaluate responses and rate them as good uh, or not so good. Um, so I love the third one here. Uh, it says the model is often excessively verbose uh, because we tend to, humans tend to rate longer answers as more correct. Loviating gives you authority. Um, but they also use human trainers to nudge it to make it less racist, less toxic, because we know the internet can be racist, can be sexist, can be toxic. And we don't want a model that reflects that. So we have human training, human feedback that then trains the model to steer it away from those answers or perhaps filter them out completely. Uh, the thing, interesting thing about these nudges is that you can take any large language model and start nudging it based on what you think is important. And that's maybe not all of us, you, but someone who has you know, uh, enough of a technical background and can uh, learn the rules for doing these kind of nudges on top of the models. And so if you wanted to build a large language model that did medical diagnoses or was good at writing or was, you know, based on known 19th century history, um, the combination of specialized knowledge sets, like I was talking about earlier, and nudging the model is where this technology is going to get super powerful. I think we'll see a lot of special use uh, models that you can use to do very specific types of queries and questions. So, is ChatGPT, these GPT models, large language models, are they generative or derivative? So, they're called generative because they generate responses to a prompt. Um, if we go back to the autocomplete metaphor and we think about how Gmail, for instance, has started finishing your sentences for you or correcting your sentences for you, I find that when I let it make those changes, my writing is less pithy, loses my style, doesn't have my voice. It also gets longer and more boring. Um, when my family started playing around with this technology, my partner Ben tried many different prompts to get a story about an astronaut and a dinosaur. And every Every single time, the astronaut was named Tom, and the astronaut and the dinosaur became friends. This was very stereotypical. Um, we say that ChatGPT can write in the style of Shakespeare, but that it could never be Shakespeare. Um, the amazing language that Shakespeare put together is now available for the model to use, but dead as a doornail or wild goose chase are not phrases that chat GPT could generate. They take con they take things out of context and put them together in a way that's really evocative for us or were perhaps for Shakespeare's contemporaries because I don't think we really, uh, I, I know that there's what dead, dead as a doornail is a technical term, but we've lost it because we don't use doornails anymore. But chat GPT can't come up with that. It can use it, but it can't generate it. So I don't like the phrase generative. I think derivative would be better. So let's talk about ways of interacting with ChatGPT, because just because it's derivative doesn't mean it's use, it isn't useful. So you have to understand its limitations and then figure out how to use it. So the most common way of interacting with ChatGPT is, is a prompt. A prompt is just a set of words, a question, a paragraph of text, a question plus four different bullet points. It's words that you ask of these models. Um, on the screen is a prompt database from Stable Diffusion, which is one of the, the image generation uh, models. And when I started writing this presentation, they actually would give you the image uh, service to play with for free, but they would 
charge you a subscription to access their prompt database. Uh, it's now free, but this kind of shows both the value of prompts and how fast this, this field is moving. Um, prompt writing was, was seen and kind of, I think, still is seen as a very valuable skill, and I think it still is. Uh, learning to write prompts is going to be interesting, and it is going to be an interesting skill for people to develop. It's not something I'm particularly good at. I'm an engineer. I'm a realist. I don't use nearly enough descriptive words when I'm trying to write prompts. Um, I actually keep a cheat sheet of, of examples that I've run across. Um, but my, my exercise for you after we're done is to go search and browse the Stable Diffusion prompt database because you can see the types of prompts people who are enthusiastic and creative and spending a lot of time working on this are doing and what they're putting in and what they're getting out. So very technical descriptions. Like the second one here has terms like ISO 200 and XFIQ4. Um, I have no clue what that is, but if I was a photographer, maybe I'd know. Um, I think people who write descriptive metadata or who help people formulate research questions, sound like anyone you know, might be very good at writing prompts. I think you should take your training and think about how it applies to this world. I also think vocabulary is a really, really important skill for prompt writing. When you think about ChatGBT being autocorrect on steroids, the words that you use are very important. And I think we all know that the best way to build your vocabulary is to read a lot. So I don't think our fundamental humanistic skills and intelligence is going away. I think words get more important. I think we'll think differently about how to use those words because the system will give us new models to use and we'll ask ourselves, how do I ask a question of a computer that thinks this way? And I actually found myself doing this, writing something I was trying to, to figure out in a way that was kind of a, a prompt style way. And I've only been playing with this for a couple of months. So it will be interesting to see how it changes how we think. Uh, one of the other models that I'm kind of, I think is even better than prompts is what's called co-piloting. So this is bringing the model into a task space. So one of the first commercial applications of this technology is in a product called GitHub Copilot. So it's an assistant that you can use as you code. So GitHub is a repository of tons of code projects. We check things into it every day. And they built a large language model based on all of the code in GitHub. And then in this example, you can see the comment at the very top, write a binary search algorithm. That's the prompt. And you can see all the stuff in light gray. That's the autocomplete. It's a suggestion. You can decide to use it or not. You still have to review it and think about it, but I think this model of co-piloting is really, really powerful. And we're also seeing co-piloting pop up in writing platforms. So on the left is a screenshot from Notion, the knowledge management tool. Um, on the right is Grammarly Go, where Grammarly has incorporated large language models into their application. Um, Microsoft is pulling this into the Office suite. Google's putting it in Google Docs. I think the idea of summarizing a long, a long document or pulling action items out of meeting notes or saying quiz me is a really useful uh, example of a large language model or a really useful use of a large language model. I think of these things as augmenting tools rather than automating tools, right? This isn't doing it all for you. It's just starting. It's augmenting what you're trying to do and making what you do faster and easier. So when, remember how I said that ChatGPT could reason, but it didn't know everything. Um, and one of the interesting things people are doing are building interfaces that uh, leverage existing knowledge bases to answer questions. So this is um, a newsletter, is based on a, a newsletter called Lenny's Newsletter. It's about you know, building software as a service platforms, which is what I do. And uh, what it does is it goes out and it searches the archive of all of these newsletters and it pulls out relevant bits to the questions that you've, you've asked. And then it takes those bits and your question and it packages them all up together and it asks G the GPT model, hey, come up with an answer to this based on this information. So it basically nudges the model to use information that it's kind of pre-selected to get a better answer out of it. Um, so I think, 
I think this is really interesting, right? And I think when you start training models on these different knowledge bases and kind of pulling information out of these knowledge bases to feed is, is going to be like, it's super exciting to me. In fact, this summer, uh, I'm working with an intern to build a chatbot based on a transcribed collection um, and from the page. And we'll do a webinar about it because I'm, I'm, I'm enthusiastic to share what we learn, but I don't know what we're going to learn, right? The experimenting, though, is, is fun and interesting. So should you worry, right? I'm not that worried, but I'm a techno-optimist, right? Um, I think you will either start with a lot of original thought and creativity, or you'll have to finish with a lot of original thought and creativity. Um, I think it's going to devolve into a garbage in, garbage out situation. So those of us who can do quality in, either via prompts or feeding it context, notes, quotes, ideas, titles, will get quality out. In fact, when we get to the kind of the last section, we'll talk, I'll give you some examples of what we've done, that what it takes for us to get good quality out. Uh, it's going to make those of us who can bring original thought and creativity into play more creative because it's going to take care of a lot of the grunt work. Um, but I'm also an adult who's trying to accomplish a specific task and I already have a decent idea about how to do it. If I was teaching, I would be thinking really hard about how to restructure assignments so that students would have to think and create rather than regurgitate facts. These models will always be better at facts than students. Uh, if you want your students to learn facts, I think you have to figure out ways of demonstrating the proficiency on those facts that does not let them have a computer in front of them. Okay, lying, attribution, and copyright. Kind of all related here, but not, I, I just know these are the questions that come up a lot when I talk to librarians about uh, ChatGPT. So um, we were visiting my sister in Switzerland over Christmas. So I asked ChatGPT, what are good things to do in Bern in the winter? And one of the answers was, go see the bears. I'm kind of excited, there's bears in Bern. So I do some traditional Google-based research and learned that there have been bears in Bern since the 1500s. You can take a tour of the historical bear pits and the newer, more humane bear preserve, and that bears hibernate in the winter, and it's closed. My emotional response was similar to as if a person had lied to me. ChatGPT doesn't try to be right. It tries to be plausible. Um, you'll hear people call this AI hallucinations. Um, I actually prefer the word lying because to me, a hallucination is something you do in your head, but once you tell it to somebody else, you're lying to them. Uh, but this is something that does happen because it tries to write plausible text. Um, the GPT-4 model, the one that's not generally available to everyone yet, is said to be about 20%, and depending on what you read, 20 to 40%, less likely to hallucinate. So this is going to get better. And what's actually interesting is every answer you get back from these models comes with a confidence. They don't show you in the user interface, but the model will tell you, I'm 80% confident this is right. I'm 50% confident this is right. And those confidences, like if it's hallucinating, the confidence is a lot lower. So I think there are ways to, to manage this and build it in, and this will continue to get better, um, which will actually kind of be problematic because it's easier to kind of find when it's lying now because you know it is, but when it's only lying, you know, 3% of the time, I think it'll be harder for us to pick up on it. But I think that's something that as humans, we have to do. Uh, there's a story out this week that a professor at Texas A&M Commerce uh, had heard that people were, you know, cheating on essays by using ChatGPT to write them. So he took all of his students' essays and uh, pasted them individually into ChatGPT and asked, you know, was this, did, was, did ChatGPT generate this essay? And then he flunked all the students who the answer was, yes, this was generated by ChatGPT. Um, but ChatGPT was lying to him and many of those students hadn't. So I thought that was kind of a, it's kind of a circular fun story, right? So attribution, there's lots of calls for attribution or auditing of answers from these large language models. I don't think it's going to be as easy as people assume it is. So if you go back to our word tree metaphor for statistically weighing what word comes next, to effectively audit an answer from ChatGPT, you'd have to have a list of documents, 10, 100, 1,000, a million, 
for every single word and each word choice. So all very, very quickly, you get a really big matrix of everything that went into generating a sentence. And it's really generating paragraphs and multiple paragraphs of text. So um, I think there's a possibility you could try to reverse engineer attribution. I've been doing some of this, trying to figure out if it works, um, where you take the answer and use it as input to a traditional search. Um, and the results maybe sort of are your attribution, but it, it really doesn't work very well. It's, there's not a one-to-one -one correlation. Um, so we are seeing tools like this one. Uh, this is called, so a lot of my examples are code related examples because programmers love new technology, love experimenting with them and love building things from them. So this is another um, it's a, a code search engine basically. And uh, it has sources over on the right, but I think they're lying. I think what they're doing is very similar to what the chat bot was doing, where they're searching a corpus of known good sites for answering code questions, pulling those answers in, and then asking the GPT model to incorporate those into any answer that it provides. So, you know, it's the attribution is the input, not everything else that the large language model uses to answer that question. So this is hard don't expect to see auditing and, and attribution. Maybe people who are way, way smarter than I am will figure it out, but I don't think it's easy. Um, copyright. So in the US, there are two cases suing, at least uh, when I started writing this, that probably is changing as fast as the technology is changing, suing AI companies for copyright infringement. And these are particularly cases on image generation. So the arguments hinge on fair use, and whether the results generated by these AIs are transformative or derivative. You already know what I think of that, um, but let's, uh, let's kind of go back and look at case law. So in 2005, publishers sued Google for indexing copyrighted books and surfacing snippets from those books in search results. Um, it took 10 years for that case to wind its way through the court system, but judges in that and similar cases ruled that Google's approach was indeed transformative. Um, the Getty is one of the plaintiffs in the two current suits around image generation using AI. Uh, they claim that the image generation models were trained on their corpus without licensing or permissions, but that only some images generated by the image models were are derivative. So who gets to decide? If you go back to thinking about attribution, it's really hard to know. Um, so this is all about images, but what about models trained on 30 years of the open web? I mean, I've I've contributed to that, but I I don't know that there's any way to to track that and have attribution to to individuals or even large corpuses of a material. Uh, we are seeing, I think, this week, um, Stack Overflow is a very popular kind of forum for asking and answering questions about coding and uh, their traffic has done, gone down, I think 17%, 15 to 17% uh, since ChatGPT has kind of arrived on the scene and they have made a statement that they're going to start charging the AI uh, companies to license their data, which I do think is fair. Um, so all this kind of hinges on who owns the results, right? And, you know, who owns the results of one of these props? The creators of the input used to create it, the transforming software that led to this particular image or answer, the prompt writer who figured out the right question to ask. I, mean, I do think that's a, a valuable piece of the puzzle. Um, I love creators and the work that they do. I really love innovation. I love open data and the creative commons, but I also know that the law doesn't understand technology very well. Uh, technology moves so fast, the law can't keep up and national borders can't contain online resources particularly well. So I think we're gonna see pretty lax laws here, even though it does threaten makers. And I'm okay with that because I wanna see what this technology can do and I wanna see the innovation happen. And I know not everyone is going to agree with that. Um, we're definitely seeing laws out of the EU or proposed laws out of the EU that kind of will limit a lot of the innovation that's happening. Um, so. This is, these are hard questions to answer. Take a sip of water. So what does this mean, especially for archives, libraries, librarians, and, and archivists? Um, I don't have all the answers. I don't even have 
I feel like I even have some of the answers, but I, have, I do have some of the answers. I just don't have, have many of the answers. So I think this is uh, uh, something for you to figure out and answer, but I'm gonna give you some examples of where we're seeing things. So uh, this, is, this is one of the first examples that we were kind of blown away with. This is by Deb Paul, who works uh, as a digitization and IT specialist at iDigBio. And um, she gave this example of taking a dirty OCR from specimen cards and asking it to find information from that. And then uh, taking that output and transforming it into Darwin Core, which is one of their metadata standards. So I think this is this is a really good example to how we use it to improve our productivity, especially on things that machines are better than humans at. Um, so Ben went and did something very similar. He took uh, some kind of dirty OCR from a, an old book. And um, and if you feed it into ChatGBT and just ask it to produce mods or mets from the OCR, what you get is actually not very good. However, you can walk through a series of steps. First, asking for bibliographic information from the title page. So there's the bibliographic information. But then you have to review it and realize that it left out the subtitle and prompting it for that. So now it's identified the information from the previous two steps. You can ask it to provide mods and then METS, then the TEI header, and the results are pretty good. Um, it made up the ISBN because there isn't an ISBN. This book is so old, so it just used one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. Um, there are probably some other small mistakes. So a human still has to review it and think about the output. But Nobody wants to do this transformation. Nobody wants to do it by hand and nobody really wants to write the script that does all this work either. So I think this is a great example of using it effectively. Um, at From the Page, we write two newsletters every month. Uh, last month, our transcriber newspaper featured some cemetery internment cards and some marriage certificates. So my teammate, Anna, used this prompt to come up with a draft of an introduction to a newsletter featuring those two, two projects. So. But look at what we had to put in to, to get that draft. Um, we had to pick the collections. We had to come up with a clever theme. We're like, how oh, are we gonna combine, you know, cemetery and marriage and we're like, till death do us part. Um, and the phrase that we wanted to use, till death do us part. And we had to add high level descriptions of the two collections. And we also told it, we you know mentioned that it's kind of morbid. And so, you know, that was, it got us over writer's block it needed a lot of fact checking because two things were completely wrong because it didn't know enough about our material. Um, but still, I find this starting point. So when I talked earlier about garbage in, garbage out versus quality in, quality out, we put a lot of quality in to get something and then we still had to do editing afterwards. For our second newsletter, um, we actually had this very rambling interview Ben had done. He had he was on the, the tail end of COVID, so he did not have a lot of, of, of energy. And we asked Chat GPT to turn it into a newsletter. Um, so we write this newsletter, we write this as a newsletter instead of as an interview. Um, what it produced was a bit more formal than what we usually use, the tone we usually use in our newsletters. So I asked for a less formal version which was a little bit too informal. Um, but between the two, we were able to put together an essay for a newsletter with about 10 minutes of editing. But we couldn't have done that without Ben's years of thinking about transcription and digital editions and the interview as input. So if you can't tell by now, I, I have a lot of respect for, for Bill Gates. He's been around for a very long time. He has seen so many changes in the world of technology. And this is a quote from him about how to make sure, you know, the world needs to make sure that everyone benefits from artificial intelligence and that governments and philanthropy will need to play a major role in ensuring that it reduces inequality and doesn't contribute, contribute to it. Um, Many of you work for public institutions, so I think this is, is part of your role in this world. Um, I think you should start by learning it yourself, and then you should work to teach others um, to understand the implications and to be part of, of the discourse around this technology. Um, this is a quote by Tom Shine who is the Associate Professor of Digital Humanities at the University of Connecticut. And when I read this, 
uh, and, and there's a link to his whole talk that he did on primary sources and AI uh, and archives uh, in, in the resources. Um, I was really shocked to read this because we've all been working so hard for decades to make our resources more findable and more accessible. I've been in conversations that literally go, how can we get Google to index this library material, right? Um, I mentioned this to Tanya Clement, who's another digital humanities professor at the University of Texas, and her immediate response was, but don't we want the archival record, all the archival information, our history to be part of the knowledge base of humanity? So two totally different perspectives, but I think it's worth thinking about both sides of this. How does your data and your information play in this world? I think there's some lessons to be learned from the GitHub Copilot example that I showed earlier. None of the open source developers I know are really worried about our code being used to train a language model. We understand that the value comes from what we build, not the specifics of how we build it. And anything that makes us faster at building the next thing makes us excited. Um, this talk actually came out of a newsletter I sent a couple months ago where I said uh, archives are the antidote to chat GPT. There's a link to that in the resources as well, but I'll kind of very quickly go through some of the thoughts I had then on how archival material in particular brings something that you can't get from these large language models. So, and especially when you think about teaching um, and, and students. So, you know, your primary sources, especially the ones that aren't transcribed, are definitely not part of ChatGPT's model. Um, even the ones that are transcribed are probably not part of ChatGPT's model. Um, and even if they are, they're not going to be statistically common in the ways that they use language. So I think even asking questions about, we should actually go do this as an experiment, um, things that are well known and transcribed out there, it, it'll be interesting to see what it comes back with. Um, I think using more human traits like teamwork and cre creativity is another antidote to ChatGPT. Um, you know, we run a, a crowdsourcing platform. We do a lot of transcription and indexing, um, but we believe that transcription and transcribing a primary source document forces a deep reading of a text. And that gives you um, analysis skills and some historical context. And it's a really, it's a deep interaction. Um, and then you can ask for observation on that process and on the material, and it becomes about a student's experience. And those that type of reflection is not something a large language model is particularly good at. Um, you can ask students to put material in historical context. So I think humans are still required to make a lot of the connections, like no butter at the store, which implies rationing, right? It doesn't say rationing anywhere in the primary source document, but we can kind of make those connections. Um, you can also ask for examples that speak to the historical context of the documents, like looking, forcing the students to read deeply and look for cues. And it's kind of fun too, right? Um, you can compare use and choice of language in a document. Um, and I think language and tone is actually going to become more important because it's part of how you prompt chat GPT to give you different types of answers. Uh, even like the punctuation and grammar that you use in your prompt affects how it answers you. Um, explore material materiality. What was something written on? What was Did they reuse material? What does it say about the technology and supply at the time? Uh, look for commonalities. What in the, the documents remind the students of their own experiences? What's, what resonates? What's so far out of their experience as to be foreign? So those are some of the thoughts I have. I'm sure you will have many, many more. So that's kind of the end of our formal presentation. Um, you should write down this URL at the very end, although we will send out a recording to this and it will include that URL um, probably Monday would be my guess. Um, but um, you're welcome to, to email me with your, your thoughts or questions about this. I'm, I, I want to have more dialogue with librarians who are thinking about how to use this in your workflows and in your, in your institutions and in your repositories. Um, we're going to kind of do Q&A. We're going to do Q&A via chat because there are many, many of you here. Um, 333, it says. Um, so Ben's going to moderate that for me. Um, while he's kind of getting that set up, I'm going to invite you. We have two upcoming webinars. Um, in a June 1st, we're doing our introduction to crowdsourcing. So if you've never thought about crowdsourcing for your institution, we would love to see you there. We talk a lot about the soft skills of uh, recruiting and working with volunteers. And then we kind of walk through 
how we think of crowdsourcing and how we've implemented it and, and from the page. And then we're doing another, um, another chat GPT webinar at the end of June on prompt writing and interacting with chat GPT because more of a practitioner sort of thing. So we'd invite you to come to that as well. Um, and that's at the end of June. We're actually doing one that's kind of earlier in the morning and one that's at 8 p.m. at night uh, central time. Um, so it can kind of hit some different geographies. Please share that with any of your communities that you think might be interested in learning more about this and share the recording of this as well. Okay, um, we'd like to thank you all for attending. To answer some quick questions, will the slide be sent to? Uh, Sarah, can you address that? Um, I don't know. I wasn't planning on it, but I can probably share that. Okay. Um, so if anyone has questions, uh, would you please type them into the chat? I will moderate and read those out. Okay, here's one. What do you think the effects of chat GPT and other AI will be on the occurrence of information avoidance? Scotty, could you explain a little bit more what information avoidance is? That term is new to me. Yeah, I don't know it either. Yeah. Um, another question about using AI to create EAD finding aids seems obvious. Um, do you want to address that, Sarah? Or should no, I? You can. You can. <laughs> it's like I, you I actually just tried to do this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I don't think I would trust it to create EAD finding aids. I did attempt to convert a PDF finding aid into EAD, and I ran into a lot of problems primarily because like I think this is the kind of thing that it would be great at because none of us want to be typing XML um, but it was not able to handle uh, a 70 page long finding aid right I think if we had access to the API or something other than the chat interface there's potential there but right now there's a technical limitation that it just can't handle that much data as part of its prompt I think and I think we'll talk about this a lot more in the, the next webinar on chat GPT. There's, if you think back to the example where Ben put in the dirty OCR, that was a title page, he had to take it through a couple of steps to get chat GPT kind of thinking in the right direction. Um, and I think for a finding aid, that would be one of the approaches I would take. Um, I also, I mean, the context window is what is the, the size limitation. So maybe we do some experiments with some smaller finding aids, like one pagers. So I think we could probably, you know, get that done in, in a page or sorry, in a, in an interaction. So maybe I will try to do that before the next webinar. Uh, here's another question. What are some of the applications you've seen outside of metadata or coding in the field? Hmm. So in the field, um, I think a lot, so I was talking, and we were at the Texas Conference on Digital Libraries earlier this week, and I was talking at lunch with uh, two librarians who um, both use Grammarly. Um, in fact, I added that screenshot of Grammarly this morning based on, on conversations with them um, to, you know, they use Grammarly as Grammarly has kind of historically been used to, to check grammar and, and you know, punctuation and subject verb agreement and things like that. But they're starting to use Grammarly Go to do things like write a formal email to all of my faculty, um, which is something that is kind of nerve wracking, especially if you're not uh, English as a first language uh, or, you know, it's, you know, it's this formal thing that is your reputation on the line. So getting a starting point for something like a formal email is something else that I'm seeing. Yeah, we're not, and we're, I mean, I gave the example of the audio transcription for our archival audio. I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Um, yeah, that's part of why we're having this conversation. Send me your examples. Where else are people using it, especially in very library-centric ways, right? Um, I can see a lot of, like, People are using a lot of image generation to go with like flyers or social advertising. So if you use um, Canva to do any any of your social stuff, um, Canva has actually tied into some of the image generation uh, models. So you can generate a, an image that you can use that arguably isn't under copyright um, to go along with something that you're advertising. So yeah, I don't know, but send me examples because I want to collect them. 
Okay, uh, here's a question that uh, Samantha had, and we've had a, a couple of other people say, please answer this. So uh, she is interested to know how ChatGPT generates citations that she's come across several examples of made up sources. And for background, you were not following, but there is a lot of discussion about using GPT to convert citations from one format to another in the chat, but also discussion about how much do you trust things it might add. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So, um, so it, remember, it's statistically weighing what is the next word, right? So there is no guarantee that if you ask for citations that you are going to get truth at all. Like it's, that's not, not what the, how the model works, not what it's thinking about. So, um, so I think one of the things that you, you know, need to tell people and tell people often is, um, it will make up citations. They are not real, right? Full stop. Um, the changing the format, um, that's interesting because generally bibliographic citations have the same information in them, right? And different formats just have slightly different ways of presenting them. So like everything, you have to do a quality review when it comes out. But if you have the input and you can look at the output and you can say, okay, yes, 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 yes. And, you know, I mean, we all know people are going to be lazy and they're not going to check everything, but that's the sort of thing that I actually, I actually kind of trust ChatGPT to do reasonably well. There's you know, the transformations that we've done. Haven't, I haven't seen like, it'll introduce things like the ISBN, but if you ask it to go from one format to another, it doesn't seem to lose context and get it wrong. So um, so I'm just going to point people on the call to a couple of comments in the chat that I think are fascinating, um, in which uh, people at libraries and archives are getting reference requests for collections that they do not actually hold, uh, because someone used ChatGPT instead of using Google to try to locate the material they were researching, and then, you know, contacted the institution to ask about something that was a, a didn't exist. I would come up with a templated response. Um, like if you can't find this using this search here, then it doesn't exist. Um, you probably generated this with ChatGPT. I think that's, that's how I would handle it. But. And then Scotty elaborated on uh, the effects of ChatGPT on information avoidance. Information avoidance is kind of the, uh, according to him, the, the, the phenomenon of trying to avoid information that doesn't align with your own beliefs. So it's kind of a sticking your head in the sand ostrich approach. Yeah, I don't know. That's an interesting question, right? Um, I think, so I think, remember there's, there's this dialogue, right? You kind of ask a question or you put in a prompt, you get an answer, but then you can kind of go back and forth. Some of the best interactions I've seen have been like 20 different back and forths between the human and the machine. Um, so what if I was, you know, someone who wanted to stick my head in the sand around something, I mean, I would probably be pushing the answers in the direction that I knew that I wanted them to go. So... I think your first answer, well, one, how you code, how you encode your prompt implies certain things, right? Um, and then what you, the next question, the next question, the next question that you ask will continue to, to push it in the direction that you want it to go because you're bringing your human biases to the table. That's, that's kind of a technical answer because I'm not going to touch the, uh, <laughs> the philosophical answer there. Humans are going to believe what they want to believe and they, they're looking for things that confirm their bias, right? Um, Sarah Kortmeyer asks, how do you feel or think about some of the doom scenarios circulating a, around AI? Yeah, I don't really believe them. I mean, technology has limitations. It's going to be transformative. But, um, you know, in the I think in the best case scenario, we all can do our jobs in half the time and there's still just as much money floating around and we get to go, you know, do dance classes and paint in the rest of the time. That would be lovely, wouldn't it? So I think that's as likely as the doomsday scenarios, but really if you're old enough to have lived through the introduction of the World Wide Web and Google and, and this, and just think about how it's changed your life. It's, you know, it's changed it in a lot of ways, but not in a lot of the fundamental ways. 
So Steve Murray says that the state archives community is thinking about best practices for language to alert human researchers to bias, mis misleading, or incorrect information contained in their digitized collections. And I know we heard a lot about that at uh, TCDL this week. I think a lot of institutions are worrying about that. Um, so he, he continues, should we also be thinking about ways to speak to AI engines that explore our collections? Uh, a gated entry, so to speak, that doesn't block access, but promotes use with a stipulated acknowledgement of limitations? Ooh, yeah, that's a super hard question. Um, that gated use is an interesting, I love that phrasing, um, because I think probably what like public archives, um, like the state archives, will... I think what we'll see is things like the licensing question that like Stack Overflow is doing with GitHub Copilot and, and other, well, Stack Overflow is actually, it's more about ChatGPT. They're like, you have to license our material. Um, I don't know that, that public archives will ask for a licensing fee, but whatever model is developed to, to address licensing particular knowledge sets, um, I think that model will inform some of the ways you can interact with these models. Um, I just don't, just, I don't know. Ben, do you have thoughts on this one? Because this is a hard one. Um, I don't have thoughts on that. I, I think it's, uh, I think it's an interesting question. I do think that it would be interesting, you know, if we get to the point where we can programmatically hand large corpora of text to something like chat GPT, it would be interesting to ask it to identify or flag offensive con content within our collections to try to figure out where we might want to either remediate descriptions or metadata or add warnings. I think um, you can do it on the fly, actually, right? You click to look at this document and it something scans it very quickly and, and answers a question, is this got um, offensive language in it or something? And you show something there. I don't know what you do at that point, but- Yeah, well, of course you also have the potential of, of you know, false positives making researchers very, very angry if they're looking at something that they consider, you know, normal and it's flagged. Um, yeah, again, humans have to review all of this stuff. Yeah, I, what I would love to see the like the state archivist community do is uh, like to see a large language model that's built on all of your digitized material, all of you, all of you, right? And to be keep adding to it as people digitize more material. Um, and then, and then what do we do? I don't know, but you can maybe start, I don't know, answering. It'd be interesting to have that model because then what comes next will be fascinating. And I can't picture it, but you have researchers who would, so. So Paloma Picardo asks, uh, can you further train ChatGPT by feeding it texts that are not likely to be on the open web? Um, I don't think you can. So, okay, I think there's two answers to that. Um, interactions with ChatGPT are, even with the API, are very similar to kind of what we see. Ask a question, get an answer. Uh, you can pull documents in and add it to your prompt, but there's there's limitations to how much of that there is, so not a ton. Um, however, there are large language models. So there's kind of two steps to this. There's the train the model, which is actually takes months and is expensive in terms of computational power and you know, processors and power power. Um, but once a model is trained, it's kind of it's it's there, and you could actually you can share the digital file that is the model. So one of those was leaked maybe two weeks ago. Uh, I think it was Facebook's. And um, the open source community jumped on it and you can build modifications on top of those large language models. Things that say, uh, I want you to you know, tweak it, you know, nudge it this way or add all this material. So I think you could build your own models. Uh, there's a lot of limitations in, in building it on top of the GPT models. So, but so sort of yes, or within a couple of years, yes. Um, and I, I will say that um, part of one of the things that our our uh, summer intern is experimenting with, um, who is on this call, Bella Barton, will be uh, working on feeding GPT systems primary sources um, 
from some of the collections we host on From the Page to explore the kinds of things we might be able to do with them and the kinds of things that you know fall flat. And we, we hope to present on that at the end of the summer. Um, another question, can you explain a bit about what's happening if you ask it to produce something relating to a starting corpus, like summarized meeting notes? Also, I'd love more info on the document formats that can be offered for summary in popular interfaces for interacting with the model, and to what extent its output will be limited to just what's contained in the offered corpus. Okay, I, it was like two questions, and I paid a whole lot of attention to the first and started thinking about how to answer it. So you'll have to come back to the second. And then okay. All right. So I was like, okay, when you're what's happening when you're doing like a meeting summary? Um, okay. Think back to the example that I gave where I asked it for um, the beginning of a story based on Genesis and the King James Bible. And it pulls out these very important words. Um, so when you feed it, here's the meeting notes, um, what's important. So I don't know exactly how it's working, but it has example, you know, there's examples of, you know, Pulling important notes from from meeting, me, you know, pulling important points from meeting agendas or summarizing documents. There's lots of examples on how you do that out there. Um, so some combination of you've given it a whole bunch of important words and it looks at what's important there. And it has some concept of kind of what the transformation is between a text document and a set of five bullets or whatever number of bullets it decides. And it combines those. And that is the extent of, of what I would say it works, so I really don't know, um, but something along those lines. Got a linguistic question. Uh, Robert Cole says, being a Catholic church historian, some of the items in my archives are written in Latin. I doubt seriously that an AI system is capable of actually understanding Latin or properly translating the language for use by researchers. Um, so yeah, what it's trained on is not, is mostly English. People are using ChatGPT to like translate live, like where you'd use Google Translate to you know go from English to Spanish or something. Um, but I'm the less language is in the model, the less good it's going to be. But it's never going to tell you it doesn't know what it's talking about. So I kind of worry about that one a little bit. Um, there's a lot of Latin out there. So okay, there's getting from the images to the text, and then there's getting from the Latin text to perhaps English or some other you know, format you want. I think the second one is actually probably it could do and you should go experiment on that because I think there is so much data out there already on how to uh, translate from Latin to English that it probably could do that reasonably well. Um, images to, to text, I don't know. Um, I do know a couple of years ago, actually pre-COVID, so it's probably five years ago, I was part of a, a hackathon um, at the University of Vienna where we trained, and this is not large language models, this is um, an NLP technology based on Python, call it the, the library is called Spacey, to recognize entities in non-Latin text. So we used Arabic and we used Mm, I can't remember what else, what would, uh, it was classical Greek, that's what it was. Um, and like software works fine on UTF-8 languages. We, it worked, and because this is all statistics, like it doesn't care what the language is. It's looking at it from a st statistical point of view. So if that language is in the model, or if you're running a program that just depends on the data you're putting in, if it's just based on statistics, it will work just as well with any anything you can encode in UTF-8 or 16 or whatever you need, like a standard. You can type it on a keyboard. You can probably make it work with these, these tools. Uh, we would be interested in playing around with this, though, if you have some sample texts. Mm -hmm. A bin, especially. <laughs> yes. OK, uh, were, Sarah, were there questions, issues with the directionality for Arabic versus classical Greek script? Oh, on that. Um... Nope, because it's all statistics, and you're, you're, what you do is you you give it a set of training data that says, you know, here's the place names in, in this text, and then you say, take that and apply it to this the rest of this corpus. So as long as everything is right to left, then statistically, your, where your, you know, what your place names are going to look like um, will be the same, like, statistically. 
so here's a common question that other people have pitched in with with answers to but the question is uh, what is the most authentic website for trying out chat gpt oh i would go to uh chat.openai.com it's a link it's linked in the resources it is it is chat gpt you want to use chat gpt you don't want to use anyone who's I mean, you could use things that are building on top of it. In fact, if you want to experiment with the, the GPT-4 model, you have to go find someone who's paying OpenAI to use their API to do that. Um, but you can, they're, they're out there. Uh, Sarah Palmer at Emory, Emory asks whether ChatGPT is decent at writing regular expressions. Ooh, we haven't tried that. Let's try it, because I hate writing regular expressions. I love writing regular expressions. I would never use ChatGPT for that. <laughs> <laughs> probably, maybe, I don't know, try it and see, right? It probably depends on how common of a case you're trying to write. If you're trying to do something really squiggly, um, I don't know, like this, you should try both cases and see and then let us know. Um, so I encourage people to read through the chat because people have given some amazing um, comments here and examples of things that they've done. Um, I think that is maybe the end of the questions. Uh, one last minute, if somebody wants to uh, put things out there, there's uh, uh, some excitement about the prompts webinar coming up. And I know that if we get uh, Will to present on uh, Whisper AI for audiovisual materials, I, I, given the content of, uh, of the earlier chat, I, I think that there'll be some interest there. Okay. So if there aren't any other questions, uh, thank you all for attending and thank you for all of the engagement. Um, this is probably the most active uh, chat conversation at a webinar, certainly any webinar we've ever held. So that, that was really great. Yeah, feel free to share the recording with your colleagues to invite them to the, the prompt writing one. And thank you for, for showing up. It really validated you know, my interest in this topic and, and, and give me a reason to go do all this research. So I really appreciate yeah. it. And, uh, and feel free to send us email if you have ideas or want to talk about this or experiments you'd like to try out. Thank you.